That was a little bit of Johnny Blues and the Bucket Kickers to open up our episode of Another Apologetic Show. For today's episode, we'll be speaking about causality and apologetics. Some of the questions we will be covering include, what is causality? How does it differ in metaphysics from physics? What kind of causality are there? And finally, how can apologists utilize it? Join us today while we take a trip into metaphysics. But first, here is some news. This week I wrote a blog response to Dave S's latest video on the subject of the end times. Also, in light of the recent plagiarism scandal of Jacqueline Glenn, I decided to re-upload an old blog where I called her out on her historical ineptitude. And unlike her, I didn't need to copy from somebody else. Regarding news on the side of Spiritually Honest Ministries, we are still working on getting the web set up. For those of you who may not have heard, Christian Anarchist, The Holy Spackle, and myself have been working on getting a blogging site devoted to all things Christian up and running. This website will feature various topics on things related to Christianity, such as movies, music, apologetics, and various other topics we can come up with. When the website is finished, we will set up a Patreon, and you could help us by donating to us. Until then, please feel free to join us on our Google Plus community page. The link will be in the description bar below, and now we return to the main topic at hand. Today, generally, we think of causality as being mechanical. That is to say, we have one object exerting its force onto another object to produce some kind of change that we call an effect. This understanding of causality was not always the view. In Europe, this view started to develop with the Renaissance and started to overtake older Aristotelian ideas of causality, which I will explain later. This change did not bury the old Aristotelian of causality, though, which still lives on today in some scholastic philosophical circles and which I hope to reinvigorate in apologetical discussion. To quote Walter Ott, card-carrying Aristotelians were hardly swept off the face of the earth by the attacks of Descartes, Galileo, and the rest. Even in Britain, at the very end of the 17th century, for example, we find John Surgent, Locke's indefatigable critic, defending what is in many respects the scholastic view. So, what is the Aristotelian view that many clung on to? For Aristotle, causality is more about explaining the existence of something, and less about reducing it to some mechanical chain of bodies acting upon one another. For Aristotle, there are four categories of causality, or as Peter Kreeflex put it, there are four B causes. When it comes to the question of what something is, it can be explained by what it is made up of, what is it made into, what is it made by, and what is it made for. Respectfully, they are the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. Here is a quote from Peter Kreeft helping to explain them. The material cause tells us what is it made of. For example, we say that a house is made up of wood, or that a sonnet is made up of 14 lines of iambic pentameter, or that Aristotle is made up of flesh and bone. The formal cause tells us what is it made into, what its form, nature, essence, or definition is. This house is a private home or a residence. This sonnet is a rhymed poem. Aristotle is a rational animal. The efficient cause tells us what is it made by. The house was made by a carpenter. The sonnet was written by Shakespeare. Aristotle is a product of sex from his two parents. The final cause tells what is it made for, its purpose, goal, good, or end. The house is to shelter a family and its goods. The sonnet is to express love to the poet's fair lady. And Aristotle, like every man, exists to pursue and attain happiness through knowledge of truth, love, and of goodness. Causality, in the more modern sense that is, is more mechanical and relies on a conception of causality in terms of only efficient and material explanations. In physics, there is no reference to 
final and formal causes because physics reduces down to quantitative answers. That is, it deals with mathematically measurable properties and not the natures of things in themselves. As Bertrand Russell puts it, What we know about the physical world, I repeat, is much more abstract than was formerly supposed. Between bodies that are occurrences such as light waves, of the laws of these occurrences we know something, just so much as can be expressed in mathematical formula, but of their nature we know nothing. Of the bodies themselves, as we saw in the preceding chapter, we know so little that we cannot even be sure that they are anything. They may be merely groups of events in other places, those events which we should naturally regard as their effects. In metaphysics, the study of what the most fundamental aspect of reality is, causality does not need to reduce to the quantitative, but still allows for qualitative explanations. The last question to give an answer to is, how does knowledge of causality come in handy in the topic of apologetics? I maintain that they are important in distinguishing the creator from the creation. For Christians, we hold that God has full independent existence from his creation. He does not change in his own being relative to the act of creating. Edward Fazer blogs about this very topic in much better detail than I can do in this video. The blog post which he does this in, I will give in the description bar below. However, I will provide one example of causality's usefulness, especially these four Aristotelian causes. When looking at the issue of God creating, it is obvious that he does not act upon something to create. That would imply that God is an object in time that needs to act upon eternal matter. But that violates the idea that God is solely responsible for creation, that God created the world from nothing. God cannot create from his own being because that would imply that he himself changes. For more on that, please see my video on the act potency distinction, the video to which you could find in the description bar below. God is the creator by way of giving purpose to the universe to exist. He is the final cause of all. By way of providing that purpose, he sustains his creation in existence. For its purpose, that is creation's purpose, is to glorify God. That is creation's final cause. It has God as its creator, its efficient cause, its nature of contingency is its formal cause, and the material that makes it up is its material cause. This reflects the great scholastic thinker Thomas Aquinas when he says of final causality, The end causes the matter to be the matter, and the form to be the form, since matter receives the form only for the sake of the end, and the form perfects the matter only through the end. Therefore, we say that the end is the cause of causes, because it is the cause of causality in all causes. I will end the show with that. To play us out, here is an overture by Beethoven.